What's going on everyone? Just a sound test. We're going to start here in about one minute, two minutes. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the stream. Hope everybody's happy having a happy Saturday today. So the stream content today I'll actually first do the channel update. So the big update is going to be the uh Engineer Man Knowledge Center. That is kind of the thing that we made a while back to collect all the knowledge for different people as well as have some challenges and contests and various other things. And the question and answer piece didn't really, you know, nobody used that a whole lot. That wasn't that popular. However, the um, the actual challenges piece of it was was wildly popular. So what we've done is, and this is a major change, is we've completely discontinued question and answer because it wasn't really used at all. And instead, we're focusing entirely on the challenges and contests piece. So. There's already some challenges there. There's about, I think, I'll probably just go there real quick. Get rid of this here. Just for a moment. Ooh, I'm huge. Okay. Anyway, larger than life here. Hold on. So the homepage, front and center, of course, is the just the leaderboard now. You know, everybody. You know, all the points. There's one guy at the top, Kyle Undefined, who's actually our newest staff member. He's completed 100% of all the challenges, which is pretty cool. So you can come here and check out different challenges. We've got some easy ones, medium ones, hard ones, but we're going to be putting more time into this, putting more effort into the, the challenges piece of EMKC, because people love this. And we're going to be adding more and then the next thing is going to be contests. Contests are going to be something that we'll do weekly. It'll be in like a code golf style format where, and if you don't know what code golf is, it's basically who can accomplish the challenge in the minimum amount of code. And it's still going to use the same solution checker that the challenges does. It's just going to record also the length of the solution. And then that's that's how things are going to be rated. It's not going to be a time based. Like you don't have to rush to do it. You know you'll have a full week to do it. And of course, different languages are longer. You know, like you're probably going to be able to do things with less code in Python than you are with Java. So we'll break it down into different language categories. That way, if you're doing solutions in Java, you're competing against somebody who's also you know, doing things in Java. So I'm going to try to get the first one of these out within the next like two to three weeks. And then from there, it'll just be a weekly thing because I got to build all the blur play for it. So that's the big update for EMKC. There is no more Q&A. There's none of that. This is purely a learning place now with challenges, contests, resources. And then, of course, you get awarded for, for your stuff. You know, if you want to be on the leaderboard, then, you know, go there and do some challenges. So... Uh, there's like 480 members in the MKC right now, and a total of like 30,000 30, points awarded, and a total of at least 700 challenges accomplished. So it's pretty cool. Some activity here. Should be a lot of fun. 
So I'll close that up. That's the big, it's kind of the big update for that. As far as the channel, channel is healthy. Don't need to talk too much about that. We're approaching 150k. I'm gonna do a, uh, I'm gonna do a 150k video, and then we'll do a 250k, 500k, and a million if that's even something that could happen. So that'll be the that'll be the schedule for that. So all right, I'm gonna take a few questions. I'm gonna look at some questions here that they've sent me. If you have any questions specifically about you know coding or whatever, not not too specific. Think more like Think more like theory, you know. Uh, don't ask me like how to convert things into a list in Python. You know, ask me something theory-based, and I can answer that here live. So I'm gonna check it out. <laughs> oh, mouse update. Yeah, mouse update. So the uh, the mouse is gone, uh, but so is my server, and I haven't fixed it yet. I need to do need to buy a new system board for it. Just haven't done so. Okay, how do I get? Too. How do I get motivated to code? So the best way to get motivated to code is to kind of skip past the point of starting to code and look at kind of the end state. So the assumption is that if you're beginning a new project, you're doing it because you either want to learn, which is a benefit to yourself, or you're doing it because you want to help other people. That's probably also a benefit to yourself as well as a benefit to others. Or maybe you're doing it to better yourself professionally you know maybe your maybe your employer has said hey you should look at react and then you want to do a react project so you got to look at the end goal and say you know i'm going to i'm going to do i'm going to put the effort in on this project and it's going to get me x y and z reward and then that that's how you can get motivated and also learning at least for me like learning something new that in itself is motivation cuz i just want to I want to learn everything. I want to learn everything there is to know about programming, computer science, and so on. So that's a good way. What's my opinion on OSCP? Is that, I don't actually know what that is. Offense, I don't know what that is, I'm sorry. What cool automated home tasks written in Python? I did a, probably my coolest home automation thing is I did a a garage door opener and this was a long time ago this was when like the raspberry pi i did it with the raspberry pi one and i want to say that came out 2000 what 12 something like that somewhere around there so i did an automated garage door opener with that i made a simple app i used a simple relay i used raspberry pi i used a wi-fi module not a module but a a, a key and then I built it up so I was able to open my garage door and that was extremely satisfying. You know, that was kind of my first foray into kind of the home automation space. A blue monk said, can I use a VM to practice Linux installations from scratch? Absolutely. In, in fact, that's the best way to do it because when you're using a VM, you can't, you know, the VM is separate from your host system, which means that there's nothing you can do in the VM that can harm your host system. And that's a huge benefit because you can be really reckless, you can be really aggressive with your installation, and you don't have to worry about messing anything up. You don't have to be careful. You can just, you can focus primarily on the learning without worrying about the consequences. What is the best IDE of 2019? I, you know, the thing about IDEs and anybody that's been in my Discord server that anytime I catch people talking about, you know, Adam's the best IDE or VS Code's the best IDE or, or JetBrains or whatever, I, I always tell people the same thing. I say the best IDE is the one that you can be the most productive with. So if the answer to that question is Adam Editor, then Adam Editor is the best IDE. For you, if VS Code is the one, then that's the best IDE for you. If you like JetBrains stuff, PyCharm, whatnot, fantastic. Yeah, some guy, Jeremy, mentioned uh, Vim. Hey, if you can use Vim and be ultra productive, and that's the thing you know the best, then more power to you. That is, Vim would be the best <laughs> IDE in that case. I am part of Team Adam, but hey, that's that's just me. That doesn't make it the best. Just makes it the best for me. Like I'm really good at Atom, and I'm not really good at VS Code. How do you do GPU pass through? I actually don't know. I've never never done that. I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. 
How is this different from hacker rank and elite code? It, I, I guess EMKC is just the place where if you want to be in the EMKC community and you want to do things where you're going up against your fellow, you know, community people, then that would be what sets it apart. But certainly there's no, you know, EMKC is not doing anything special in the way of, of challenges. Of course, you can find, you can find challenges all over the place on the internet. Oh, French fruits. Python GUIs are tough. What is your go-to? PyQt, Tkinter, or nothing? I I like so I like Tkinter. I think it's lighter, and I also like if if I'm building certain blood. There's a thing called WX Glade, and that's a nifty way to build kind of GUI applications with with Python. But uh, Tkinter is also fine too, and. Py, PyQt, I mean, PyQt, I would say, is the most comprehensive because it's backed by Qt, which is which is fairly heavy. But, so it's all like what you're wanting to accomplish. And then, you know, certainly nothing could be an option as well. I mean, if uh, if, you're, if your GUI can be serviced by like a terminal, like a TUI, like a terminal UI, then I, I suppose that'd be fine too. And thanks a lot for the 10, French Fruits. I appreciate it. He's a longtime supporter. So thank you very much for that. Now something good. Do more jail. Okay, good. Question. Where can I learn Linux? Okay. So I have a good PDF for that. I'm gonna post it later. Just somebody remind me on Discord. I have a I have a really cool like systems administrator. PDF for hot, for learning Linux and it's one that I've read myself. It's really great. It teaches you a lot of the a lot of the basic terminal commands. I, I know I said systems administrator, but it reads more like a, a junior systems administrator, which kind of teaches you the basics of Linux. So if you remind me on Discord to get that for you, I will I will kick that PDF over to you. I, I don't I don't use Microsoft Azure. I, I host on a Google Cloud Platform and I also host on DigitalOcean, which works for me, but it could you know I guess Azure's fine if you're doing Microsoft stuff. Okay, so there's a lot more questions. I'm gonna put some of these on hold and we're gonna get to the coding, but I promise I'm gonna we're gonna come back to answering that. So what are we coding today? We are coding, you know, so if you read the title it says everyday Python programming. And it's it's important to understand what that means in the context of of what type of coding we're going to be doing. So I've had a lot of people, some of my friends, they they approach me and they say, you know, Brian, if I wanted to get involved in programming, you know, I have no programming skills. What what would I do? Like, what projects would I take on? And I always tell them, I say, what things do you do manually today? And they say, well, I you know. I do some manual things, you know, for my job, you know, maybe I, maybe I work in a legal office or something and I'm constantly going out to a site to get updated data, you know, or I'm crunching some numbers in a spreadsheet or I just, hey, Kevin, what's up, man? Glad you could make it, you know, or I'm, you know, or I'm, I'm doing some, some particular task for, uh, for whatever I'm doing. And so everyday programming is like, you know, what's the minimum amount of skills you need to learn to do something useful uh, that would help you out just as a normal person? So I picked two examples today that we're going to do that are applicable to pretty much everybody who works with a computer. Not necessarily, not necessarily a programmer, just people that work with a computer. So we're going to be doing two things today. We're going to be processing vCard contacts from a export that came from Google Takeout. And then we're going to process some spreadsheet data that was in Google Sheets, but we want to pull it into Python to do some advanced kind of calculations on it. So that's that's the two things we're doing today. So you know, the first is the contacts. If if you don't know this, Google lets you export all of your data off of Google. And but the problem with that is it's not always in the here. I, I won't blind people. Uh, but it's not always in the most consumable format. So in this case, 
for the contacts, you know, when you export your contacts through Google Takeout, what you get is you get a VCF file and it's a it's a V card file and there are plenty of things on the internet that will that will consume V card information. It's just what if you come across the one place that does not? You know, what what is your solution now? Do you just manually do all this? You know, do you just one by one? You know, take the name, copy it in, take the email, copy it in, go to the next one, and then what do you just do that a thousand times? Like that's that's ridiculous. You know, why would you do that? So we're gonna build just a simple script that just reads the V cards into some structured format and then output it into the format that you actually need, whether that's comma separated, tab separated, JSON or just some some proprietary standard. So we have our context.vcf. And all we're going to do is just read that into a variable. And these are really short scripts because remember, these are designed to be for people that have a little programming language. It's like how little amount of programming would you have to learn to shorten copying a thousand contacts down to writing a five minute script. So we're going to write like 20 lines of code, something like that. So simply we'll do with, you know, open, you know, context.vcf. So that's going to be our, that's going to be our context file as F. And then we'll just set like, you know, context equals F.read. You know, we'll read everything into that variable and it will just strip the white space off the end and then split on a new line. And just that alone is going to get us, you know, all the lines of, oh, I gotta, so you can see that gets us a, it gets us a list of all the elements that are, that are in the V card. Now this itself is not useful, but you know, here in a moment, it's, it's going to be useful. So we'll continue modifying our code. And we know that we want a just a, a list of names. So we'll do, you know, names. Create a list there. We'll do name equals nothing, email equals nothing, and you know we're, we're going to try to extract the name of the email. And the intent to <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So all these contacts are just from some site. I think it's called Makaru, where you could just specify, you know, I, I want a thousand fake contacts. So none of these are uh, real. I, <laughs> that'd be amusing if it was from that. Come on. We need more LOLs. We only got like 10, everybody LOL in the chat. So All we're looking to do now is just put the right name in the variable, right email in the variable, and then just place it into the names list. So to do so, we'll do for contact and contacts. And all we're looking for is, you know, we know that, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Make it rain with those lulls. So we're looking for FN and we're looking for email and and we already know the format of vcard. Oh, keep in mind that there is a Python vcard library. We're just not going to use it because the short way is more or less just as short. So, you know, we'll do email. We'll do if email in contact. If it is, then we'll set the email to be the contact dot uh, split on what semicolon? No, colon, colon, yeah, colon, and that will take the last one. So that should give us the email. If fn in contact, then we'll do name equals contact dot split, and then for the con for the fn, it's going to be everything after the colon again, and we'll take the last element. And then we just have to check that if we're at the end of the v card. So each one is like begin v card version fn and then NV card. So this is one, this is one V card, you know, and then second V card, third V card, and so on. So we're just looking for end V card as the boundary. 
So we'll do if, you know, contact equals and vcard, then we got to do two things. One is append the, what would it be? And, and this is where we're going to append whatever the format is. So maybe we want it in comma separated. So we'll do brace comma brace dot format name email. So let's check our code. So we're good here. It's it's everything we need. And then now it's just iterating over that. So for name and names, print name. And ta-da, we have all our names and we have all our emails in a big long list. And technically this is comma separated. If we wanted to write this into a comma separated you know, file, we could simply do python3 context.py use the redirection operator and then specify context.csv. That will write all that content to context.csv and then here we are. All we'd have to do now is just come up at to the top, put name, comma, email, and then magically that will import into whatever system. And this is a really quick way of taking those V cards and getting them into a, a better format. So this is one this is kind of it's kind of one example of just a, a really simple thing. So let's let's review what we did here. We started by reading the raw contacts into a variable, and then we looped over every line of the contact file and started looking for emails, first names, and then when we got to the end of the V card, we just appended the name and email into that list, and then we printed out that name. And this could be in whatever format. If it needed to be tab separated, you know, you could put a backslash T there. If it needed to be some proprietary format, like it needed to be, you know, email then name with a colon, with, you know, three colons, and then the the email had to be first, name had to be second, then you could you could simply do it that way. So there's tons of ways you can mutate this data to work with the target system that that you're looking to import the stuff into. So that was the first example. Very simple, very simple example. And this wouldn't take a person that long to learn. They'd have to learn how to open files. They'd have to learn what split does. They'd have to learn how to iterate over a list. And then they'd have to learn a simple if statement. I mean, you, you could probably teach somebody that in under a day, I would say. Uh, y negative one and not one. So it probably would have worked one, but negative one just says take the last element, and and that's what I was interested in. I I don't I don't personally know the exact format of V cards. So, uh, but it very well could have been one. That that would have been that would have been perfectly fine. It, in this case, it would have worked. Uh, negative one should work, you know, all all the you know all the time. Okay. So the second thing we're doing, and I'm going to post all this code on GitHub, so don't worry. You can go and you can run it yourself later. That'll that'll be perfectly fine. The second thing we're doing is we're looking at spreadsheet data. So I have a spreadsheet here, and people I'm sure have worked with spreadsheets, you know, all the time. It's one of the most popular things ever. So I have this really long spreadsheet. You know, maybe your boss at work said, "Oh, speaking of that, if you could, if you're in a non-technical job, and there's no tech people around you, and you can find a way to interact with your non-technical job using things like Python, you will blow people's minds. You will become ten thousand times as as as." That useful at that job as you previously were. I've I've also held jobs that were not tech related, but I used tech to help that job, and it made me quite valuable. So, I mean, certainly try that out. You know, if there's lots of spreadsheets out there, and there's not as many Python programmers. So we have a we have a spreadsheet, and now don't get me wrong, spreadsheets are super powerful. Google Sheets is powerful, Excel is powerful, they're all powerful. You can do a ton of stuff, and probably what I'm about to do you can also do through a spreadsheet, but you know, at some point you're going to need to do something that you can't do directly through the spreadsheet. So 
If somebody hands you a spreadsheet, start by exporting it however you need to into CSV. Now in my case, I go to File, Download As, CSV, and then it downloads. So after that, you can get rid of your spreadsheet and you're done there. Go to my folder here, and this is what it extracted for me. It extracted me all these names. I don't know exactly what this data is. It's all just fake stuff. It looks like order dates, you know, units, unit cost. Let's look at it again. So uh, imagine you wanted to say how many units were sold in the East region. And I'm sure there's a way to do it through the spreadsheet, but what if you need to interact with another program? Like maybe your company uses some internal system, some database, and you need to insert it into that database automatically. That's probably not something a spreadsheet can do. So for this example, we're just going to look at, or we're going to sum up all the units that have a region of East, except we're going to do it through Python, not through Google Sheets. So we have our data here, and we need to get this into a format that, that works well. So Python, right off the bat, Python has a CSV module. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel on that. You simply do import CSV, and you're good to go. Uh, now you can use the facilities that are made available by the CSV module to kind of make that work. So it's very simple. So you can you can pull things into Python in one of two ways. You can pull it in either as a as a list or as a ordered uh, ordered dictionary. And of course, ordered dictionary is easier because it lets you reference things like order date. You can subscript your you know dictionary with order date, region, rep, item, and that <laughs> yeah. Automate your coworkers out of a job. Don't do that. That's going to piss people off. Uh, or, or maybe you want to. I don't know. That's up to you, I guess. The. So we'll start by. Well, we could do both examples. So we'll do with open, data dot csv, as f. And then we'll do rows equals csv. So csv dot. There's two things here. There's a reader and. The, coworker.py. Yeah, that's fantastic. We're, we're going to come back to that. That's amazing. So there's two things here. There's csv.reader and there's csv.dictreader. So, you know, one is reader, f, and then the other one is dictreader. And each of these, one reads the, th you know, one reads it as a list, one reads it as a dictionary, and then you can use whichever you want. Today, we'll do the dictionary version. And then we're going to do rows, row for row and rows, just to get it into a normal list that we can close the file. So right now, our rows should be a list of dictionaries, a list of ordered dictionaries, I should say. So Python 3, uh, what's this called? Data, data, pi? Yeah, so here it is. So you can see that there's one there's one ordered dictionary here, and it has the information that you need. So, but this is all in the right format. This this is what we need. So now, you know, we said we want to sum up how many units are, you know, for the region east, and very simple to do. You know, you can do it probably with one line. We're going to not do it with one line, just so you can you know watch it. So we'll do like we'll set the sum to zero for row and rows. So this will loop for every single row in there. And then we're going to do if row region equals east. Then we're going to insert the integer of row. And I think it's, what is it, units? Units. So put units in here. So this, this should be what we need. I, I think this is the whole code. So this will give us, let's comment that out. Yeah, so you can see 10,365. So that's going to be how many units are in the region east. So you could also do, you know, region, could change it to central. 
17,985. And, you know, th this was a very quick way to, <laughs> yeah, row, row, row your fort. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, this is a quick way to kind of, kind of mutate this data in, into whatever you need. And this was not a lot of code. You know, once, once you read the data into a list of dictionaries or a list of lists, then what, an additional five lines of code to get a sum, you know, that's pretty cool because you could also do grouping. You know, you could also write it so, you know, it adds units to a dictionary based on the region. You know, I, I suppose we could, we could do that. You know, if we wanted to modify this, you know, rather than one sum, you know, we, we can instead do sums. Then do things like east. What, what else do they have? Central, west, and then, oh, I guess that's it, central, east, and west. So rather than doing, you know, just adding it to the sum, we can do sums, row, region, plus equals, int, row, units. And then this should give us a kind of a grouping of, you know, what units are, are in which. Well, that worked. That's cool. So east, you know, is 1065. Now what's cool about this is imagine if somebody had asked you, hey, we need you to write a program to take this data and then insert it into our other system. So on, you know, at the bottom of this code now, you would simply write whatever you needed to write to push this into another system. And I'm going to put this back just so that stays. And, and, and now you can do whatever you want with it, or you can set it up to run on a on a job to run once, you know, once a day or once an hour, or there's just unlimited things you can do to work with this data. You know, you could even have a system save the file on top of the current one, overwrite it, and then run this on top of the new file. So, yeah, pretty cool, right? Seriously, try it. You know, find something, find something in your daily life that you just do, that's just really manual, that you just do over and over, it's mundane, boring, and then just write a program for it, and you don't have to do it. It's especially great if you can do it in your job. There's also a website that I'm going to let you guys know about that, and this is not a paid promotion, it's it's just something I came across while I was, you know, prepping for the stream, and it's called Automate the Boring Stuff <laughs> with Python. You don't actually have to buy the book. You can, uh, there's all the stuff at the bottom. It's uh, automatetheboringstuff.com, and you know, there's a table of contents with all the additional content. You can, of course, buy the book if you want, but it's, you know, this is like the exact stuff I'm talking about when when I'm, you know, showing some examples. You know, it's spreadsheets, it's web scraping, it's PDFs and Word documents, working with them, you know, scheduling tasks, launching programs, sending email and text, manipulating images, and then CSV files and JSON data. You know, like that's, when I think of boring stuff, and I think of easy things to automate, mon you know, p potentially mundane tasks, like that's the stuff that I'm referring to. And so you should check that out. There's some interesting examples there. You know, if you need some like, if you need some food for, uh, you know, some thought generation on, you know, what what ideas, you know, you like to work on. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. You know, if you're looking for some good ideas, like that's some. Um, that's some interesting stuff there. Okay, let's take a couple more questions. We're uh, we're we're running way ahead. We got about 25 minutes left. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back to questions. Uh, War Paddle, are you interested in machine learning and teaching it? So I am very interested in it. However, I'm not currently teaching it because. One thing that's important on my channel to me is that I, anybody that's spent any time in Discord that's, that's talked to me about different things knows that I don't, I don't try to know it all. I don't try to project, you know, to you guys and gals that I know it all. I 
I want to bring you high quality content and the best way I can do that is to take on topics that I know very well and machine learning is just not one of those things so if if I got to a point where like I knew machine learning really well and I thought that I, I had a good enough grasp on it to where I can make a video and and teach all of you I, I promise you that I'll do that and, and potentially that's that will happen in the future until then you should go and check out Sentdex, who has fantastic machine learning him and I are friends so uh, all good you, know, you can you can check him out uh, he has great machine learning stuff he's he's the machine learning guy but I think in the future you can expect to see some machine learning stuff come out of my channel it's just I I first need to fully fully grasp it and I don't currently so let's see where can I oh, I already did that one what uh what's a unique Raspberry Pi project that's not commonly done the thing about Raspberry Pi is that they've sold so many units and they've sold so much stuff that I'm not entirely sure that there there is a such thing uh, perhaps a a screen for your car you could attach like a five inch screen to it you know, maybe that'd be something uh, firewall a VPN those are probably common though. I don't know, Raspberry Pi, that's a super popular plot, you know, super popular project and there's just so much done with it that I don't I don't know that there's anything that's not. Did you have a hack the box account? I I don't, but that sounds really cool. You should tell me on Discord what that is so I can check it out. How does one begin to understand where to begin learning to code? So if I understand that correctly, that's like a it's like a meta question on what. So it all starts on first understanding what a programming language can accomplish for you, and I I kind of you know there were a couple people in the chat that said I'm not even a Python programmer, what am I doing here? And you actually showed up to a good stream because maybe you're not a Python programmer, but are you a guy with contacts? Are you a guy with spreadsheets? So, uh, Bill Rostin, thank you very much for the seven. That's very nice of you. Please do a Python GUI tutorial of either Tkinter or similar. I, I think I should. I think I need to do a GUI tutorial. I've only done one. It was GTK3 with, uh, with C. And I think it might be time to do a Python one. People have been asking for it as well. So, uh, thanks for that suggestion. And thank you for the seven. I appreciate that. Um, let one of the staff know if you're on Discord. Let one of the staff know who you are. Just DM them, and uh, you get a special role on Discord for donating. So thank you. Yeah. So learning how to code, you gotta first identify. You gotta say to yourself, uh, you know, what do I want to accomplish, and know what a programming language can do for you. And the good thing is, it can pretty much do anything. R really, literally, you know, technology is so advanced today. There's so many tools. There's so much pre-built code that not only can it do everything, but the barrier to entry is so low that there's a lot of stuff that's already kind of out there that just makes it easier for you to get moving. Do you do any front end stuff? Yes, all the time. I do tons of front end stuff. Like I'm a big React guy these days. I've never used Vue. Uh, I also have done Angular one. I've done some Angular 5. I know there's kind of a big jump there. I, I don't care for Angular. I really like React. I like material design. I like uh, Bootstrap. And I like jQuery. I'm trying to think of others. And of course, there's a litany of other you know modules that I like as well. Where's the first Python stream? I, I don't know what that means. There's, I think my first or second stream, uh, August, I, I do streams every two weeks and I started doing this in August. So I think there's August number two, I believe is Python. Uh, Sierra McCar uh, 
Macaulay, I also want to learn everything about programming, but I find it overwhelming. How do you narrow your focus that you actually learn something? I think the best answer to that is going to be try to stick to one language. Stick to one language to start, you know, don't get carried away. The, what makes things really overwhelming is people say, all right, well, I'll start with Python. And then they're like, well, I'm interested in web. So now they're on HTML. And then they're like, oh, well, I want it to look nice. Now they're on CSS. And then it's like, well, how do I store data? Oh, well, now they're doing databases. And then now they're doing jQuery. And then React. And then Django. And then frameworks. And then it's just, it gets out of control. It starts spiraling out of control. And the next thing you know, you got this big bag of, of uh, 20 pieces of technology that you know about 0.5% of. <laughs> and, and that's how you get overwhelmed. So I recommend s just stick to one thing. Stick to one thing and pick something that is relevant to what interests you. And then just learn that really well first. Because once you learn one programming language and you learn the fundamentals very, very well, yeah, oh, shiny. That's exactly it. I mean, programmers love shiny stuff, including myself. I see something shiny. I'm like a, I'm like a squirrel, just run after it, and the that's just what it is. So, learn the fundamentals, people. Seriously, you got to learn the fundamentals first and foremost, and then after that, it's not that hard to learn other things. You know, once you learn your first language, language two through ten are, are a lot easier because they all have several commonalities across all of them. When I learned Python and Aaronet blog. Okay. When I learned Python and the Aaronet blog, sometimes it's in two point oh and sometimes it's in three point oh, where could I get to learn Python? Oh, where can you learn Python? So Code Academy is one option you can, of course, learn Python from my channel, and then you can learn Python. I, I recommend you watch a lot of videos. Like, don't just watch mine. You know, don't just watch Sentexes. Don't just watch whoever. You know, watch everybody's, because everybody's going to teach it differently. And you need to hear it from several people, because we're all, like, I'm not going to be the best at explaining something. And, uh, you know, other YouTubers may not be good either. So you have to, you got to take it all in. You got to take a bunch of different content authors, all their videos, take it all in, and just take the parts that make sense to you from each. I'm a web programmer, PHP and JavaScript, who's also becoming gradually more comfortable in Bash. I'd like to get more into scripting and automation work. So if you just want, if you want to get into just general programming, like system type programming, then Python is a, a fantastic option. If you're going to be working primarily on Linux systems, then it's going to be important that you know Bash, which is a born again shell, and it's also a full fledged programming language, or has. Well, I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear here. So it's it has constructs that are similar to other programming languages, but you can do most things or you can leverage tools that are common to Linux to accomplish most things. So in short, TLDR, I would say Python and Bash. I would like to learn about virtual environments in Python. Can you cover that in the videos? Uh, if I if I find a way to sneak that in, I will. I'll definitely do that. I don't think I've ever covered virtual env, but I probably should. Uh, will you do a tkinter tutorial? Yes. Uh, hey, you man. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Vado, uh, Vado, Vado. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Hey, you man. I'm doing more and more JS. Recently, I want to get deep understanding of JavaScript. I was thinking of reading MDN, Web Docs, try to check out V8. What would you recommend? So, I don't think it's necessary to read the V8 code because that's C. And that's the JavaScript interpreter. That's probably not necessary. Reading the V8 code and understanding how that works is probably not going to make you a better JavaScript programmer. So, however, the MDN is fantastic. You know, that's the that's the single source documentation for JavaScript. I, I've personally read that entire site, the entire thing, everything on it that relates to JavaScript. So, I would certainly read that. It's and it's not that hard to read. 
you know, there's built-in objects for JavaScript. You're going to want to know each of those very, you know, very closely. And then you're going to want to understand all the syntax. So, yeah, if you want a full, comprehensive, deep understanding of JavaScript, you'll want to read the MDN from front to back. Everything that relates to ECMAScript 6 and beyond. Oh, good one. Tristan says, what does it mean when something like a framework is a lightweight or heavyweight? So it's all about abstraction. It's all like I can provide you a framework for JavaScript that will just do a couple things. And then it relies on you to pick up the pieces for the other things. So like maybe I write a JavaScript framework that just parses incoming data, but you're responsible to do everything else. You know, that would be considered a lightweight framework and it, it would be very low overhead. You wouldn't take a huge performance hit to use it, but it's also not that useful. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, you can find really heavyweight frameworks that, that define everything that are hundreds of thousands, if not, you know, a million lines of code, but they are extremely comprehensive. They do everything. They offer you the most feature sets. However, you are going to get some inefficiencies with that. Heavyweight software does come at a cost. That that's just what it is. You know, if there was there's there's just no such silver bullet as super duper fast and efficient and comprehensive. It just doesn't work that way. What are your thoughts on Docker and I don't know if it's Kubernetes or Kubernetes, but whichever it is, Kubernetes, the, I, I love Docker. So my thought on Docker is it's an amazing piece of technology and everybody who is a modern developer, you know, in 2019 needs to at least take a peek at it because you're, uh, you're in, invariably going to come across in some organization where people are, are deploying their entire software stack in a containerized kind of architecture. And if you're not prepared for that, then you're going to be behind the curve. So certainly you need to be looking at Docker. It's uh, it's terrific. I, I containerize everything these days, primarily because I'm just sick of dealing with, I'm sick of dealing with upkeep on applications. I'm sick of dealing with different versioning. It's just, it's, it's just a pain. So definitely, definitely check that out. Should I learn, okay, Alpha Pictures said, should I learn Python or Java as a beginner? So uh, back in nine, back in 1990, hey, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the, for the five. Love from Wales. <laughs> MAGA, nice. Cool, thanks a lot, appreciate that. Thanks for the support. If you're not on, uh, I know you have that K, that looks like Karen's K, but if you're not, if you're on Discord and you don't have the, uh, if you don't have the supporter role, please let one of my staff know on Discord and they'll get you hooked up. Should you learn Python or Java as a beginner? So when I started out, I learned, I know everyone's going to laugh at me, laugh at me in the chat, it's okay. I learned PHP as kind of my first major language. But keep in mind, this was back in 1997, this would have been PHP 3, maybe 4, can't remember exactly. And I, I felt like that harmed me in the long run because my fr that's right, get the lulls going, get a, get a lulls train going. The, I think it probably harmed me because it's a dynamic language that had no type system. And it was kind of my first, it was my, it was my first thing that I learned seriously. So when I got to learn things like C and Java, oh my God, it was, it was a disaster because uh, you know those those are all typed. I'm looking at this like what what is what you know what is bool this and int that and string this and I was like PHP don't have that. I never learned this. I wasn't pre I wasn't prepared for this. So I yeah, I felt kind of disadvantaged. So I I guess my answer is you should you should understand types check out Java for its types. You know, the fact that you have to define types and understand how that works. 
And then once you understand that, go to Python where you don't have to use types and you can continue learning from there. I, I still think you should learn Python, but don't make the mistake I made and just ignore this entire, uh, this entire world that we call the, the typing system. Also, I just noticed we're at 397 viewers right now. Three more, and we're going to go above the 400 mark. That's never happened. This is, the, this is the biggest stream of all time so far on this channel. We recommend using libraries in Python. Yeah, absolutely. You should use core libraries, and then you should also use libraries that are, you know, libraries in Python are the same as libraries like an NPM or other places. They will rise up if they are good, and then the bad ones will get pushed to the ground. So the good thing about using libraries that are already pre-built is that they usually have a community around them, and they're usually very stable. If people trust them and you can use a library with confidence that it's going to help you more than you trying to roll your own. We're at 400. There it is. 400 viewers. Awesome people. Very cool. Very cool. So absolutely use libraries. I, I do all the time because number one, I don't want to spend the time reinventing the wheel. And number two is I guarantee that a project that's been worked on by like five or 10 people over the course of months is going to be more stable than what I can produce at a at a given moment. Oh man, 406 now. Whew. Nuts. Why don't you use contact that starts with? Oh, I guess I could have. Yeah, I guess I could have. I, I don't know. I just all, all this code, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of coding all this live. I'm just kind of doing what comes to me in the moment. But yeah, context starts with would have been perfectly fine. How to display data from a database to a web page one by one. You so getting data from a database to a web page is really just making a query for that data, and then once the data comes back into your application, you can prep the data in the way you want and then you can pass it to some sort of template renderer and then in that template renderer you can usually do a for loop on your data which you can display row by row and that's that's more or less what it would do what does four percentage one do so that's the that's the modulo and that basically says that it's basically division where it returns the remainder. So it's a it's a way of figuring out if something's equally divisible by something else. So you could do like, let me pull it open here. Let's do this real quick. So like four mod one, you can see is zero. Four mod two is also zero, but four mod three has a remainder of one because three goes into four once and there's one left over. So that's that's kind of what that does. I I use the modulo operator a lot when I want to do pagination. Like if I want to say, you know, do something every 500 items, you know, I can do I can do data set size, you know, mod 500 and then if it's a zero, I know it's divisible equally. Actually, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Uh I'm trying to think what I would actually do. Yeah, well, you can use that for pagination. I, I can't think of an exact example in my head at the moment. Uh, what is CSV? CSV is comma separated values. It's a format for data that's not dependent on any particular, you know, like language. You know, CSV is not specific to Python or JavaScript or Microsoft or whatever. It's just a, it's a format where you have all your headers separated by commas. You have all your values separated by commas, unless it contains a comma and then it's quoted with a quote. Unless it also has a quote, then it's escaped. Ooh, so many questions. Where can we get sample data you're using? For, okay, I, I guess we're past that now. Uh, can you explain row for row and rows? So row for row and rows. So I'll set up my, well, I guess I should have been rows. So my rows is a list. So for row in row, will for row and rows will will loop over every row 
a one time per iteration. So when you do row for row and rows, <laughs> it's you're saying take that value and return it in that iteration into like a list. So we call that list comprehension. So if I wanted to like just double everything, I could I could put I could start a list, I could do row times two for row in rows, and then that would give me two four six. So row for row probably seems weird, but you gotta remember that the first part is kind of the thing that will be returned. So I can specify things like you know times two or times three or or whatever. Ooh, lots of questions. Okay, I'm gonna try to get through these questions. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, will you ever do any Golang? Yes, actually, Piston is in Golang, and we have a we have a super high speed Golang expert on the Discord server. His name is Professional Pizza. He's uh he's the best best Go program I've ever met. So uh, if you guys have any Go problems, post in the well, not, not not problems. You know, he's 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 a smart guy. So you gotta you gotta give him smart questions. You gotta make the questions match the person. So if you want to, if you have any go theory you want to talk about, you can uh, you can definitely check it out there. Uh, probably other languages is the best place for that. We have more Python videos on your channel. So I've been doing a lot of Linux lately. Probably when I'm done with Linux, I'm going to circle back to Python. So that'll be good. So if you're if you're missing a lot of the Python videos, then know that they're they're coming back soon. Have I ever used Django personally? No, I've not. I I don't do a ton of like I don't do any any web-based Python programming. All of, I only do I only do system stuff in Python. So yeah, I just don't do any web stuff that, that's related to that. How long did it take you to fully learn Python? I, I would argue that I still haven't fully, you know, learned it. Like I'm I'm super efficient in it. I can do whatever, but to to fully learn something is a is a massive feat. I, I would say that it took me a few years to get, you know, really, really solid and stable with it. So a couple of years. Can you execute a Python file on a web server? Yes, you can. You can do so through CGI, which essentially just you put a you put a hash bang at the top of your file, and then you use a CGI module with a web server, and that web server simply executes the file that you request, and then the output goes into the page. So you can. It's not a common way of doing it. You know, these days that used to be the only way. That's how Perl. Things like that was executed back in the day, but uh, these days, mm, there's not a whole lot of CGI going on. Not not as far as I've seen. I haven't seen it in years. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I totally missed the supporter question board. My bad. I'm assuming you can implement somehow actual files. Okay, Sorcerer, I'm, I'm going to get back to that, that question offline. I, I'm not sure how to answer that here on stream, so I'll definitely check that out. Yep, I see it, I see it. You think Python... No, Alexander Prusak, do you think Python is a noob's language? Uh, no. I think Python is is easier... Uh, easier than other languages to to get ramped up on, but I don't think I wouldn't call it a noob's language because that has the connotations of this language is only for beginners and therefore it's not as good, and that's simply not true. Like PHP is one of the most popular, the most widely deployed, and the most powerful languages on on planet Earth. So, but at the same time, it happens to be extremely readable like almost human readable and you know that's of course very helpful let's see 
morning C. Morning C plus plus right now, but kind of hard. What do you think? Should keep with it or do pi or something? Uh, that was by Bad Ash. So you need to figure out what your end goal is. Are you, you know, do you want to make games? Are you going to do C plus plus professionally? Uh, if so, you should definitely stick with it. But if you want a more simpler, you know, language that where you don't have to worry about things like memory management, then then certainly you know Python is a good you know good choice for that. Okay, one more question and then we're gonna wrap it up. Things language. Okay, I'm gonna answer this one. Sick boy said, Guido has left Python. Do you think this language still has a future? I that's a good question. That's a fantastic question actually. So. Him leaving, he left due to health issues, and I, you know, he trusts the people that are building it. You know, for better or worse, they're going to do what they're going to do. Uh, the reason I'm not super worried about the Python's future is because it's still open source software, and therefore, if you know, you saw what happened with Node.js back when back when Joint was the steward of it. You know, it forked to IOJS. They did massive advancements in it. They remerged into Node.js, and then the Linux Foundation took them over. So you never have to worry about open source because if somebody is a bad actor or doing bad things for the Python community and the software, well, guess what? Somebody's going to just take that torch and they're going to run with it. And we're going to... Python's going to be fine. So I think it's okay. Uh, it's never good when, it, when a Titan, like, you know, Vito and Rossum leaves his own project, but at the same time, it's it's okay. People people leave all the time. Keep in mind, you know, Linus Torvalds, who runs Linux, you know, he's eventually going to get too old to do Linux, and, you know, we're going to have to trust whoever picks up the torch from there. But in the end, it's still open source software. Okay, that's it for the stream. I just want to say thanks to everybody. We hit 413 viewers. It's insane insanity. Uh, there's a new video coming tomorrow. I I don't know the exact topic yet, but there'll be one tomorrow. And then you should check out, there's a link in the chat right now to check out Discord. There's a, there's a fantastic Discord server operated by myself and my team. And people are chatting with everybody every day. There's tons of learning going on. It's tightly integrated with EMKC. And I think you'll find that out of all the servers you're going to be on, it's the it's the best managed one, it's the best curated one, it's the one with the least nonsense, and there's a globally diverse audience of different countries, different skills, different time zones, people that like different things. So there's a there's a wide variety. There's like 4,000 people on there, of which probably 10 to 15 percent are active. So. Uh, it's a good place to be. If you're not there, there's a link right there, discord.gg slash engineerman, or you can go to engineerman.org slash discord. Either one works fine. That's it for the stream. Uh, within the next half hour, I will post all of this code to GitHub, so you can check it out if you want to run it offline. But other than that, uh, thank you so much for coming to the stream. Thank you so much to the supporters you know, who, who flipped me a few bucks. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. I don't. Uh, I don't usually. I don't ask for any donations ever. So when people, you know, feel feel like they they want to, you know, give, that's that means a lot to me. And then, uh, thanks to all the regulars, I see a lot of the same names every two weeks showing up to the streams. That's that's fantastic. So thank you uh, to all those people that uh, that continue to come and and support the channel. You know, with their with their presence. You know, it, I'm sure it means a lot to other people as well. And I think that's it. I will I'm on Discord all the time. So if you need to get in contact with me, just you know shoot me a message there. Other than that, have a fantastic rest of your weekend. Check out the video tomorrow and I will see you on the stream two weeks from now, noon. And uh we'll get back to it. Everybody take care. Have a good one.